Hi viewers, I have an announcement for you. See, pre-storming, which is a reliable test series for UPSC prelims, is offered by our Shankar IAS Academy. Already three batches are running successfully, and the fourth batch, which is having its first test on 21st of December, is open for enrollment. See, aspirants, do make use of this test series. It will be really helpful for clearing your prelims in an easy manner. With this happy notes, let's start our Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar AS Academy for the date 17th of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion. See today we have and 8 articles are from different topics. Now without wasting much time, let's get into the first news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. This news article is about a notice issued by the National Green Tribunal to the Tamil Nadu state government. Why the notice was issued? Because the state government plans to construct a monument of the Marina Beach in Chennai. The monument is supposed to be in the shape of pen and it is planned to honor the former Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, Dr. Karnanidhi. Here the problem is not with regards to the monument, but where it is planned to be constructed. That is the problem. It is proposed to be located around 360 meters into the Bay of Bengal from the Marina Beach. So, it is planned in a marine ecosystem. That is why environmentalists are concerned over it, which led to the filing of a public interest litigation. The moment I said marine ecosystem is involved, you should have understood that the coastal regulation zone notification comes into play. See, the proposed monument falls under the CRZ 1A, then CRZ 2 and CRZ 4A areas. So, it is worried that the monument might affect the marine ecosystem. Therefore, now the NGT has sought the state's response to the PIL. In this regard, let us see about NGT from preliminary perspective. See, it was established in the year 2010 as a statutory body and it was established under the National Green Tribunal Act 2010. It functions as a specialized judicial body that is equipped with expertise solely for the purpose of adjudicating environmental cases in the country. That is why it is dealing the case with respect to the marine ecosystem. Okay? See, for fulfilling this purpose, the tribunal is empowered to deal with the subjects in the legislations mentioned in the Schedule 1 of the NGT Act. I had given what are all the legislation. See, just go through it. This is very much important because in prelims, they might give these legislations and ask which among the following are present or not present like that questions may be asked. Okay. Now coming back. See, there are several reasons behind its establishment which forms its objective. First is for the effective and expeditious disposal of cases relating to environmental protection and conservation of forest and other natural resources. Secondly, to enforce any legal right relating to environment. Then it is also empowered to grant relief and compensation for damages to persons and property and for any other matter connected with it. So to carry out these objectives, no, it has presence in five zones namely the north, central, east, south and west. But the principal bench is situated in the north zone which is headquartered in Delhi. Okay. Then it enjoys several powers like it is not bound by the procedure laid down under the Code of Civil Procedure 1908 but it is guided by principles of natural justice. Also its orders no, are binding and it has the power to review its own decisions. If this fails, the decision can be challenged before the Supreme Court within 90 days. Other than this, no, the tribunal is mandated to dispose applications or appeals finally within 6 months of filing of the same. Then what about its composition? See, it is headed by the chairperson who sits in the principal bench and it also has two sets of members who are judicial and expert members. Then each set can have at least 10 but not more than 20 members. Okay. So that's all regarding this news article. See, through this news article, you had known why this case was filed and then we had known about this NGT and its role in dealing with environmental cases. Am I right? So, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. 
Now have a look at the snippet article. It mentions that a marathon was organized by the Indian Army to celebrate Vijay Divas. See so what is a Vijay Divas? Vijay in Hindi means victory and Divas means day. So a Vijay Divas is celebrated to remember the bravery and sacrifices of the Indian defense forces especially in a war. We normally hear about Kargil Vijay Divas which is celebrated in July. But then this Vijay Divas is for which war? It is to commemorate the victory of India over Pakistan in the 1971 war. See here the war was fought between the allied forces of India and Bangladesh on one side and Pakistan on the other. Now let us quickly recap what led to the war. See it all began in the 1970 due to the internal crisis of Pakistan. Don't forget here that at that time Bangladesh was a part of Pakistan that is from 1947 to 1971 this Bangladesh was part of Pakistan and was called as East Pakistan okay but the people of Bangladeshi region resented the domination of western Pakistan and the imposition of the Urdu language on them It was an unfair treatment to the Bengali culture and language of the Bangladeshi region. So they started protesting and demanded fair representation in administration and a fair share in political power. This popular struggle against West Pakistani domination was led by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Remember he had an additional demand of autonomy for the Eastern Bangladeshi region that is liberation of Bangladesh. In between all this elections happened in the then Pakistan Awami League won the elections in eastern Pakistan which was led by Sheikh Mujib through this the Awami League secured a majority in the proposed constituent assembly for the whole of Pakistan but the government dominated by the west pakistani leadership refused this scenario and took three actions one is it refused to convene the assembly second it arrested Sheikh Mujib third is the operation search light pakistani army was used in this operation by which the mass movement of the bengali people was suppressed you know that at that time pakistan was a military rule under the presidency of general yahya khan as a result of this operation no thousands were killed even today operation search light reminds one of the most horrific examples of mass atrocities and brutal killings in recent history This operation led to a large scale migration of Bangladeshis into India. See around 80 lakh people migrated. So it created a huge refugee problem for India. And India intervened. It supported the demand of independence by the people of East Pakistan and helped them financially and militarily. This resulted in a war between India and Pakistan in December 1971. After a long war on 16th December 1971 the Pakistani forces having 93000 troops surrendered unconditionally they surrendered to the allied forces of India and Bangladesh in Dhaka the end of the war resulted in the freedom of Bangladesh that is why this war is famously known as the Bangladesh Liberation War since at that time Indira Gandhi was a prime minister newspapers reported like this Yahya eels to Indra ends war. So India was bound to celebrate this historic military victory over Pakistan. For that every year on 16th December Vijay Divas is celebrated. Okay? Its objective was to commemorate this glorious occasion also to pay homage to our gallant soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice in the service of the nation. Okay? So that's all regarding this news article discussion. See, we took just the snippet article and discussed about the Bangladesh Liberation War in a brief manner, and then we saw why this Vijay Divas is celebrated. Okay, so this is the way we take a small article and cover, which is very much relevant for our UPSC examination. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. The news article says that. The Supreme Court set aside a direction given by the Allahabad High Court. The case in question here regarding theft of electricity by a person. He was awarded a total jail term of 18 years. The Allahabad High Court also held the sentence 
to protect the convict's personal liberty the supreme court set aside the direction of allahabad high court while pronouncing the judgment our chief justice of india said that the right to personal liberty is a precious and inalienable right recognized by the constitution this is about the news article in this context no let us go through article 21 of the constitution which grants right to life and personal liberty see article 21 no as we all know deals with the right to protection of life and personal liberty and the article says that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law this article mainly restricts the state which is nothing but the government here from encroaching upon our country citizens right to personal liberty there is one exception that is provided in this article itself it says that the state can encroach upon the citizens right to personal liberty by procedure established by law that is if the parliament makes a law that restricts the citizens right to liberty then the government can encroach on our rights so this is about this article 21 see this is a very important article various judicial and constitutional experts or of the opinion that if there is a competent judiciary then by a wider interpretation of this article all other fundamental rights can be derived from it this is why in the unikrishnan's case our supreme court termed this article as the heart of the fundamental rights now let us see the evolution of article 21 through various supreme court judgments as i already said from the plain reading of article 21 we can interpret that if the parliament makes a law that restricts the citizens right to liberty then the government can encroach on our rights but let us say for example if the parliament tomorrow makes a law that says that every citizen in india must wake up at 4 am every day and do surya namaskar then our executive that is our government will implement it Although this law encroaches upon the right to personal liberty and prevents our right to sleep till 11 a.m., we cannot oppose it. This is because the law was made by a competent parliament. This would be the case if Article 21 is taken literally. So this provision of Article 21 was always controversial. So obviously there were various cases regarding this. Now let us see some important cases in this regard. The first important case is the A K Gopalan vs State of Madras case that occurred in 1950. In this case, our Supreme Court made a narrow interpretation of Article 21. In this case, our Supreme Court said, if a competent legislature makes a law providing that a person may be deprived of his liberty in certain circumstances, then the law is valid. The validity of such a law cannot be questioned in the court of law. that is how arbitrary unreasonable or unjust that law is if such a law is passed by a competent legislature its validity cannot be questioned in a court of law through this judgment the legislature held an upper hand over the judiciary see this opinion prevailed from 1950 to 1978 in 1978 the famous menaka gandhi versus union of india case arrived In this case a supreme court interpreted article 21 quite literally the court said even though article 21 has word procedure established by law it inherently means due process of law after this interpretation by the supreme court the advantage that legislature held over the judiciary came down now the judiciary and parliament were placed on the same footing Now if the legislature makes an arbitrary unfair or unreasonable law that is taking away our personal liberty its validity can be questioned in the court of law even though such a law in question is passed by a competent legislature okay here you have to know that the british follow procedure established by law whereas if you take usa they follow due process of the law See the Supreme Court reiterated the same opinion in the Francis Crail Mullen versus Union Territory of Delhi 1981 case. In this case, no, the Supreme Court said that under Article 21, no one shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except 
by procedure established by law but this procedure must be reasonable fair and just and not arbitrary whimsical or fanciful okay so through this judgment also the supreme court placed a restriction on the power of the legislature the next major supreme court judgment regarding article 21 is the unni krishnan was a state of andhra pradesh that occurred in 1993 it is one of the important judgments that expanded the scope of article 21 See in the judgment the supreme court said right to life under article 21 actually means the right to live a meaningful complete and dignified life so to live a dignified life the court said the following rights are required the rights include the right to go abroad right to shelter right against solitary confinement right against custodial death right of every child to a full development and right to pollution free water and air so this is why at the start of the discussion i said if there is only article 21 and there are no fundamental rights a good judiciary can interpret it literally and provide all the fundamental rights from it there are some other supreme court judgments also regarding article 21 which we can cover in the future discussion hope this discussion regarding article 21 was useful See, we had taken various judgment to say that Article Twenty One is very much important. In your preliminary perspective, if you take knowing what is Article Twenty One and what are all covered in Article Twenty One, that will be more than enough. But when you take in means perspective, is Article Twenty One the heart of fundamental rights? Then you can utilize these points to enhance your answer. You can make really your answer look unique and worthful. Okay. So with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion look at this editorial article this editorial article talks about the recently concluded UNSC special briefing on global counter terrorism approach see the briefing was convened by india in new york the briefing highlighted the hurdles to better counter terrorism cooperation and ways to address it So in this backdrop let us understand some of the important points that is mentioned in the news article also we'll have some basic understanding about UNSC okay before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference you can just go through it see now before getting into the context of the article no have this basic understanding the security council was established by the UN charter in the year 1945 and it is one of the six principal organs of the united nations its primary responsibility is to work to maintain international peace and security see the council now is headquartered at new york and that is why the briefing was held in new york now if you have a doubt about why india convened the briefing it is because india is the president of unsc that is united nations security council for the current month that is for december 2022 yes the unsc is composed of 15 members in which five will be permanent members and 10 will be non permanent members the five permanent members include china france russian federation united kingdom and the united states whereas the 10 non permanent members are elected for two year term by the general assembly These ten non-permanent seats are distributed on a regional basis. See, India has served seven times in the UN Security Council as a non-permanent member, and in January 2021, India entered the UNSC for the eighth time. So this is all about the membership of the UNSC that you have to know. Now remember, the presidency of UNSC rotates among the fifteen member states. of the council monthly the head of the country's delegation is known as the president of unsc the president coordinates actions of the council decides policy disputes and sometimes functions as a diplomat or intermediary between conflicting groups see each member of the security council has one vote so if a decision has to be made in unsc nine members among the 15 member states have to vote positively among those nine members five permanent members of the council have to vote concurrently that means a no vote from any one of the five permanent members of the council will block the passage of the resolution 
So, apart from reaching an agreement through mediation or dispatching a UN mission to settle the dispute, the Security Council also oversees the work of UN peace operations through periodic reports from the Secretary General and Council sessions. See, the UNSC can even impose sanctions in response to a threat to international peace and security. So, in that line note, the UNSC convened a special briefing on the global counterterrorism approach. See, this UN global counterterrorism strategy is a unique global instrument. Its purpose is to enhance national, regional and international efforts to counter terrorism. And it was adopted by consensus 15 years ago, that was in 2006. This is the first time in which all UN member states agreed to a common strategic and operational approach for fighting terrorism. This move of UNSC you know, sent a clear message that all forms and manifestations of terrorism are unacceptable. So, while briefing on the global counterterrorism approach, our external affairs minister listed four hurdles for better counterterrorism cooperation. Let me list out one by one for you. First one is state support for financing terror. Then multilateral mechanisms that are opaque and agenda driven. And the third one is the double standards and politicization of counter-terrorism according to where terror groups belong. And the next frontier, here he was mentioning about the use of emerging technology such as drones and virtual currency by terrorists. See, note all these points, all are important and the article also mentions that the sanctioned regimes launched after 9 by 11 are in chaos. There are many instances where the strength of sanction regimes is checked. For example, while easing Taliban's path to power in Kabul, the UNSC's permanent members, especially the US and the UK, tested the flexibility of the sanction regimes. Second such instant is when China, a P5 country, no, that is a permanent country, blocked the designations of Pakistan-based terrorists. And the third such instant is when the P5 nations refused to do, come together to accept India's 1996 proposal for a comprehensive convention on international terrorism. See, the briefing by India is therefore working to put words into action while the rest of the world tests the strength of sanctioned regime. See, India even convened a UN counter-terrorism committee meeting the No Money for Terror Conference and an Interpol conference also. So to conclude, the article says that the government should keep on focusing on giving a new strength to the global agenda and counter-terrorism architecture. See, India should highlight the necessity for international cooperation on the matter and it should persuade all nations to contribute resources to the fight against terrorism. So that's all regarding this news article. See, in this news article, we had covered regarding UNSC also holistically and we also made a point to discuss what was briefed in the global counter-terrorism approach by our external affairs minister. See, when the hurdles that we had mentioned are removed, no, the fight against terrorism or we can say the counter-terrorism approach can be implemented effectively. So in brief, we can say that that a state support for financing terror should be stopped, then multilateral mechanisms that are opaque and agenda driven, then the double standards and politicization of countering terrorism, then terrorists using emerging technology such as drones and virtual currency should all be restricted. Then only the counter-terrorism approach can be efficient. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this article. It talks about a rice festival which was organized in the district of Vainat, that is in the state of Kerala. See, the rice festival was organized with the motto of promoting climate resilient rice varieties. And this was done by a Kerala based organization called Tanal. And this organization planted nearly 300 climate resilient varieties of traditional rice on 1.5 acres of land. So this is the crux of the news article given here and in this discussion we will learn about the rice crop and the conditions required for its cultivation. See a variety of food and non-food crops are grown in different parts of our country 
and it is depending upon the variations in soil climate and cultivation practices major crops grown in india are rice wheat millets pulses tea coffee then you can also go in for sugar cane oil seeds cotton and jute etc etc now let's specifically see about rice cultivation in india as we all know rice is the staple food crop of a majority of the people in our country it is a karif crop which requires high temperature generally about 25 degree centigrade and high humidity with rainfall above 100 cm here i said karif crop am i right what does it mean karif crop means the crops which are grown between june to november now coming to the regions of rice cultivation in india say rice is grown in the plains of north and northeastern india then even in the coastal areas in the deltaic regions development of dense network of canal irrigation and tube wells have made it possible to grow rice in areas of less rainfall for example you take punjab haryana even western uttar pradesh and parts of rajasthan in these places and all rice has been grown because of irrigation okay so from this we can see that rice is grown all around our country so now the next question is who are the leading rice producing states of india as of 2020 to 2021 the top 3 rice producing states of india are west bengal uttar pradesh and punjab say around 36 percentage of india's total rice production is from these three states alone for example if you take west bengal it contributed 30.62 percentage of the total rice produced in india then uttar pradesh nearly 12.81 percentage while punjab accounted for 9.96 percentage now let's see a few points about the article given today see the festival which the article reports about is aiming to sensitize people by showing the significance of conserving traditional crops see they have the ability to withstand harsh climatic conditions and these traditional crops have wider adaptability and resilience suited for the particular climate in which it is cultivated for longer periods so by conserving these traditional crops we can reduce the risk of changes in environmental conditions not only this we can stop crop failures then we can reduce market fluctuations and attacks of the pest and diseases so these are all the advantages of preserving traditional crops so with this we have come to the end of this discussion see we quickly revised about rice crop then we moved on to see what is the importance of traditional crop when you just revise traditional crop it is important for preliminary perspective but when you read about the importance or significance of a traditional crop you can utilize it when your main answer is based on this hybrid versus traditional crop okay always know to take an article in both prelims as well as mains perspective okay so these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article this news article talks about wheat acreage see according to the news the wheat acreage has increased 3% so far in the ongoing rainy season so in this news article discussion let us quickly go through wheat and the conditions necessary for its growth see wheat is the second most important cereal crop in india after rice it is primarily a crop of temperate zone but it is a highly adaptable and it can be grown beyond even the 60 degree north altitude as well as in temperate and frigid regions of the far north see it can also be cultivated in tropical and subtropical zones also wheat is able to withstand extreme cold and snowfall and begin growing once spring time warm weather arrives so from the shore to 3300 meters above sea level it can be grown so in short we can say that the best wheat is grown in regions that benefit from cool damp conditions for the majority of the growing season succeeded by dry warm conditions to allow the grain to ripen hence its cultivation in india is done during winter that is in rabi season this rabi crop requires a cool growing season and a bright sunshine at the time of ripening see it is requiring 50 to 75 cm of annual rainfall evenly distributed over the growing season about 85% of the total area under this crop is concentrated in north and central regions of the country that is in the indo-gangetic plain then the malwa plateau and himalayas 
up to 2700 meter altitude being a rabi crop it is mostly grown under irrigated conditions but it is a rain fed crop in himalayan highlands and parts of malwa plateau in madhya pradesh and if you note about 14% of the total cropped area in the country is under wheat cultivation when you talk about the leading wheat producing states uttar pradesh madhya pradesh punjab haryana and rajasthan stands at the top See the yield level of wheat is very high in Punjab and Haryana whereas in Uttar Pradesh Rajasthan and Bihar they have moderate yields See the states like Madhya Pradesh Himachal Pradesh and Jammu and Kashmir grows wheat under rain fed conditions that is why they are having low yield okay So that's all regarding wheat you have to know this is very much related to your preliminary perspective okay With this information you can attempt any prelims based questions Okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this article it talks about the issue of linking aadhar with voter id the issue was brought up in the parliament by two opposition mps responding to the question the issue was brought up in the parliament by two opposition mps responding to the question law minister of india said that aadhar linking with the voter id is not mandatory The minister also informed the Rajya Sabha that more than 54 crores of the nearly 95 crore total voters have opted to link their Aadhaar details with voter ID. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, now let's learn about Aadhaar in a very detailed manner. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference. Kindly go through it. Now let's start our discussion. Firstly let us start with the origin of aadhar see developed countries and even developing countries like china have databases of their citizen while also providing for each adult individual citizen of the country a unique identification number such a unique identification number no assigned to a citizen would be a proof of his or her identity for a variety of purposes this is with respect to global scenario now coming to india Presently there are different means of establishing identity in India such as you can take electoral identity card income tax that is pan card then passport ration card driving license birth and education certificates etc etc however none of the systems are equipped to handle a population figure that exceeds more than 100 crores in India so this is where aadhar becomes important and this is the exact reason why aadhar was introduced see according to the government no centralized database of the citizen of the country with a set of unique identification number has several potential benefits to its citizen because it will improve the efficiency of administration so this is all about the need for aadhar in india now let's see how aadhar was introduced in india to undertake the mission of providing unique 12 digit number to the persons who are residing in india unique identification authority of india was established in the year 2009 see it was established after a notification by the planning commission nandan neelakeni the co-founder of infosys was appointed by the then government to head the project See he is the same person who is now heading the development of open network for digital commerce which is abbreviated as ONDC. ONDC is being developed by the government of India to open the digital marketplace in India. He note that ONDC no tries to break the monopoly of foreign companies acting as intermediaries in the digital marketplace. If successful it will bring a huge change in how digital market places operate in India now coming back to our aadhar see what we have seen till now is the need and how aadhar was introduced in India now let's see the technical details of aadhar see aadhar is a 12 digit individual identification number issued by the unique identification authority of India This is on behalf of the government of India. This number will serve as a proof of identity and address anywhere in India. That is any individual irrespective of age, gender who is a resident in India and satisfy the verification process laid down by the Unique Identification Authority of India can enroll for Aadhaar. 
here you must know two things firstly to enroll for aadhar he or she need not be a citizen of india being resident in india is alone enough for enrollment here a resident is a person who has resided in india for 182 days in the last one year preceding the date of application for enrollment of aadhar okay so in any case aadhar number cannot be a proof of citizenship or domicile okay secondly any individual irrespective of age and gender meaning even children right from their birth can be enrolled for aadhar but for children below 5 years no no biometrics will be captured later between the years 5 and 15 no the uid of children that is the unique identification of the children have to be updated with their biometrics of 10 fingers iris and facial photograph and for this alerts will also be sent to the registered mobile number of the parent see i have said that aadhar had been implemented through a notification by the central government in the year 2009 but this changed in the year 2016 to empower the system of aadhar in india so parliament gave statutory backing in the form of aadhar that is targeted delivery of financial and other subsidies benefits and services act so now the system of aadhar governance in india has statutory backing so this is all about the technical details of aadhar that you have to know now coming back to the issue discussed in the article the issue is that according to a judgment of the supreme court aadhar can be used to identify welfare scheme recipients see through this judgment supreme court has allowed government to exclude those beneficiaries of the welfare schemes who don't have aadhar card this judgment makes us question whether aadhar is necessary for obtaining other identity cards in india the answer for this question is no so you have some understanding now right with this now let's see the issue of voter id linkage with the aadhar card election commission of india has recently started the process of linking voter id with aadhar card this has raised concerns about whether government can exclude voter ids which are not even linked with aadhar this is why the opposition mps no raised the question and as we have seen already law minister has said that voter id linkage with aadhar card is purely a voluntary exercise with this we have come to the end of the discussion see through this discussion we saw about the origin and need for aadhar in india then we also saw about whether aadhar is necessary for receiving welfare measures from the government and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the recent issue of linking aadhar with the voter id see it is purely voluntary and not mandatory okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article this news article reports that in kerala a petition sought a cbi investigation into an issue but the kerala high court dismissed this petition so can anyone seek cbi investigation let us find out now see cbi that is central bureau of investigation as its name suggests is a premier investigative agency of india it functions with a dual responsibility one to investigate grievous cases and second to provide leadership and direction to the police force across the country especially in fighting corruption see fighting corruption was one of the basic objectives with which the agency was set up here you should know that originally the organization was created as the special police establishment after that the organization has grown so much so we will see its growth and timeline now see it was set up as spe in 1941 that is as a special police establishment with a pure mandate to investigate cases of bribery and corruption but its jurisdiction was limited to the transactions with which the then war and supply department of government of india was concerned in this time the special police establishment functioned under a dig in the then department of war Later in 1942 its mandate was extended to handle cases of corruption on railways also but to further extend its jurisdiction an act was passed in the year 1946 called the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act this act brought in many crucial changes 
to the Special Police Establishment or SPE. Firstly, the SPE's name was changed to Delhi Special Police Establishment, that is DSPE. And as I already said, it extended the SPE's jurisdiction to Union territories. This is as per Section 2 of the Act. This means the Delhi Special Police Establishment can investigate offences in the Union territories also. But the same jurisdiction can also be extended to other areas by the central government. It can be extended to railway areas and states. So this is provided by Section 5, Clause 1 of the Act. But for that, no, one condition is to be satisfied as per Section 6. See, the condition is acquiring the consent of the concerned state government. Another major change was SP's superintendence was transferred to the Home Department. Then its functions were enlarged to cover all departments of the government of India. Then another major development happened in the year 1948. This is when a post of Inspector General of Police of the Special Police Establishment was created and the organization was placed under his or her charge. In 1953, no, an enforcement wing was added to the Special Police Establishment. So, from 1953 to 1963, cases under different laws were entrusted to the Special Police Establishment. Thereby, it was authorized to investigate offences under 91 different sections of the Indian Penal Code and 16 other central acts. But, in the year 1963, there was need for a central police agency at disposal of the central government which could investigate many other cases other than bribery and corruption. So this led to the setting up of Central Bureau of Investigation by a resolution in 1963. See, it was mandated to have many divisions, namely Investigation and Anti-Corruption Division, Technical Division, Research Division, Crime Records and Statistics Division, legal and general division, then even administrative division. Here, the investigation and anti-corruption division is nothing but the Delhi Special Police Establishment. But with the time, many other divisions were added to the organization. So currently, the divisions are anti-corruption division, economic offenses division, special crimes division, directorate of prosecution, administration division, then policy and coordination division, Lastly, the Central Forensic Science Laboratory. Okay. So, we can see that in the last 75 years, the organization has evolved from an anti-corruption agency to a multifaceted, multidisciplinary central police law enforcement agency. Here, know that CBI derives its power to investigate from the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act only. But what cases can they investigate as per Section 3 of the Act? They are authorized to investigate only those cases which are notified by the central government from time to time. But with the time, now the CBI has grown to handle cases of conventional crimes such as murder, kidnapping, terrorist crime, etc. etc. And also economic offenses, banking frauds and crimes with international linkages can also be handled by them. Apart from this, even the Supreme Court and High Courts Entrust cases for the investigation to the CBI based on petitions filed by aggrieved parties. So from all these it is clear that the Supreme Court and High Court have the power to entrust cases to the CBI. Other than this no, it also acts as the nodal agency for enhancing interstate and international cooperation in law enforcement. Also here you have to note that the director of CBI as Inspector General of Police of Delhi Special Police Establishment is responsible for the administration of the organization. Currently, CBI is functioning under the Department of in Ministry of Personal, Pension and Public Grievances. Okay. So, that's all regarding CBI you have to know. See, we had known the entire timeline of the evolution of CBI. Along with that itself, we saw the functions or the roles or the powers that CBI has. And this much is enough for your examination perspective. Okay. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the preliminary practice question discussion. See, today we have five questions in which three I will be discussing and two will be a quiz question for you. Now, let's start with the first question. It is regarding the National Green Tribunal. See, here three statements are given and you are asked to find the incorrect statement. Okay. So, let me start with the first statement. It is a statutory body. 
yes that statement is correct because we saw that this ngt or the national green tribunal was established in the year 2010 under the national green tribunal act am i right so it is a statutory body now look at the second statement it has the power to grant relief in the form of compensation and damages to affected persons yes this statement is correct they can grant a compensation okay and now look at the third statement it is chaired by the chief justice of india see this statement is incorrect because the qualification to be a chairperson is a former or incumbent judge of the supreme court or chief justice of high court the chairperson is appointed by the central government in consultation with the chief justice of india okay see during discussion we just saw that it is headed by the chairperson but the qualification we did not see am i right that is also covered in this question right now what is the answer for this question since it is demanding for incorrect statements your answer here will be option b 3 only now look at the second question it is regarding the cbi discussion okay here you are asked to find the correct statement okay here four options are given right let me start with the first option see option a is incorrect see cbi derives its power to investigate from the delhi special police establishment act 1946 so it is incorrect okay now look at option b it is also incorrect see as per section 2 of the delhi special police establishment act it can swomo to take up investigation of offenses notified in section 3 only in the union territories taking up investigation by cbi in the boundaries of a state requires prior consent of that state as per section 6 of the act okay then the central government can authorize cbi to investigate such a crime in a state but only with the consent of the concerned state government see the supreme court and high courts however can order cbi to investigate such a crime anywhere in the country without the consent of the state see be clear with this they can take somoto cases in union territories but if in case of state they must have the consent of the state government okay now look at option c it is correct because it does not say only the central vigilance commission enjoy superintendence over the cbi the superintendence of cbi related to investigation of offenses under the prevention of corruption act 1988 lies with the central vigilance commission and in other matters with the department of personnel and training in the ministry of personnel pension and grievances okay so to conclude the central vigilance commission enjoys the superintendence of cbi okay now look at option d it is only partially correct see cbi is the interpol of india so cbi acts as an interface between the law enforcement agencies of india and other countries to ensure such cooperation it facilitates exchange and sharing of information by these agencies it also published the red notices of the fugitive criminals wanted in india but it does not deal with their extradition see the ministry of external affairs is the nodal agency for extradition of fugitives cbi interpol can help the law enforcement agencies in tracing or locating the fugitive okay so that is why this option is incorrect okay now finally what is the answer yes it is option c now look at the third question see it is regarding the bangladesh liberation war of 1971 while covering the vijay divas we also covered about this bangladesh liberation war am i right so now look at the first statement it was a war between bangladesh india and pakistan yes right because bangladesh and india was on one side and pakistan was on the other side so this statement is correct now let us look at the second statement indira gandhi was the prime minister of india during the war yes this statement is also correct even i displayed a news article right saying that Yahya yields to Indra ends war, right? So now, what is the answer for this question? Since the question is demanding for correct statements, here both statements are correct. So your answer here will be option C, both one and two. Okay. See now, if you see that the Bangladesh Liberation War and all we had discussed, and this question was easy for us to answer. Likewise, if you see the quiz question, they are also based on some of our article discussion. So if you had keenly observed the discussion you can easily arrive at the answer for those quiz question. I hope you will all answer the question in the comment section and the right answer will also be posted in the comment section itself. And displayed here are two mains practice question for you. So go through the question and try writing answer for these question. It will be really helpful for your mains examination. 
and that's all for today's discussion if you like this video do like share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the shankar is academy's youtube channel thank you for listening